Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our first New Zealand webinar. Um, it's great to see so many people uh, attending. Um, today, we're going to explore the very latest grocery uh, shopper trends, um, how COVID's impacted shopper behaviour, um, and what it all means for the future of your supplier retailer conversations and your category development strategies. Uh, my name's Dan. Um, I'll be doing the technical side of things today and uh, also endeavour to answer any questions that you may wish to pose. Um, I'm an Insights Director with Shopper Intelligence uh, and I manage the Woolworths account here in New Zealand as well as several uh, other supplier relationships. Um, and we have with us this morning Andrew Arnold who leads the business uh, in New Zealand and, and our Shopper Insights um, side of things. Um, give us a wave, Andrew. Hello, hello. Um, and we also have uh, Simon Ford, who is our Managing Director for Australia New Zealand and actually founded the company some 11-ish years ago, Simon. Is that right, isn't it? That's um, right. Andrew's going to speak to what we've seen in New Zealand so far, um, and Simon's going to bring us a bit of a wider context you know, from Australia and, and also globally. Um, so just before we begin, I, I want to go through some housekeeping. Um, we do have a lot of people here, and it's fantastic to see. Uh, just ask that everybody remain muted if you could during the presentation. We'll be monitoring the chat function, so you know, feel free to engage with us there. Um, but if you do have questions uh, that you'd like answered, if you could use the question function, that would make it much easier for me to manage those. And uh, we'll pause on occasion as we go through to try and answer them. So don't be shy. Um, with that uh, sort of out of the way, I'll hand over to Andrew. Andrew? Thank you very much, Dan. So it's wonderful to be here this morning and it's great to, uh, to be able to present to you guys today how to win the New Zealand grocery shopper. So this is all about understanding what the shopper is looking for in the current New Zealand grocery environment. So before we do that, before we actually get started though, what we would actually would like to do is we'd like to start off with a poll. So we'd just like to ask you guys a question and just take a bit, a bit of a bit of a stab at what's going on at the moment. So, first question is: Is that what do you think is most likely to have happened over the last over the past twelve months? So the options there are: There's been more buying for emergencies. There's been more buying to consume now or to use now. There's more buying to consume later, i.e., stocking up or there's more buying to consume later outside the home. So some fairly different ideas coming through there about what actually has happened most likely over the past 12 months. So let's see what the results are. So the results that we're seeing here, so most of you are saying that you there is more buying to consume later, i.e. there is more stocking up happening over the past 12 months than there has been in the past. So that's an interesting point of view. There's a few of you who are saying that there's been more buying to consume now, and there's a few of you also saying there's been more buying for emergencies as well. So that's interesting. So hopefully over the course of the next hour or so, we will be able to give some truth to, to those viewpoints. So. Let's, let's move into it. So, firstly, what I would like to do though, is I would like to just explain what Shopper Intelligence is and how it all works for those of you who are not familiar with us or who have not worked with us in the past. So, in a, in a nutshell, what this is all about is understanding why shoppers do what they do. So there are lots and lots of sources of data out there, and those are all, if by the way, extremely good sources of data. Things like scan data, things like loyalty card information, so one card information, or uh, things like club card, things like basically um, things cards that the retailers are using. That is a good source of loyalty information. So basket data, that sort of stuff, very, very uh, strong source of information. Panel is also extremely strong source of information as well. Things like home scan or your own retailer, uh, so your own research uh, panel data sets as well. What those sources of data though all have in common is they are extremely good at telling you about what has happened. They're not necessarily that good or that strong at telling you why 
what you are seeing in the data has happened. And that's where shopper intelligence comes into the, to, to the party. We're all about understanding what shopper wants are, what their needs are, what their behaviors are, what motivates them. So when you marry that with these other sources of information, you actually are in a very good spot to understand exactly what it is that your category requires in terms of an approach to ranging or pricing or, or anything like that. So we are giving the ability to unlock the meaning and the other sources of data that you have. So what this really boils down to is, is that we are all about placing the shoppers at the heart of decision making. And that really comes in three areas. The first thing I've spoken a bit about already, and that's about understanding what those shopper behaviors and those motivators actually are. So it's really important to understand what exactly does a shopper want from their shopping experience in any given category. So for example, if they want, uh, what exactly does a shopper want in terms of buying breakfast cereal? Or what is it that, that motivates them in terms of buying chocolate biscuits? It's all about, those sorts of uh, ideas, which are in the, in the mind, their mindsets, you can't necessarily find those out from a, from a source of scan data or something like that. So you really want to understand what those shoppers are actually looking for um, mm -hmm. when they're going shopping every day. Secondly, this is all about understanding where you need to prioritize your investment at that category level. So the secret behind this for us is that we benchmark all of the responses that we get across all of our categories and all of our retailers. So that's all about understanding, does this matter to my shopper to begin with in this category? And is it being delivered to expectations or not? So if you know those two things, you actually can get a really good, clear understanding of do I actually need to invest in this area to begin with? Or is the amount of investment that I have actually okay? Or can I even, in some cases, pair back a little bit of the investment that I've got going on in this particular area. Again, it might be price, it might be instant experience, there might be a whole range of things. But we're all about helping the, you to understand where do I actually need to prioritize my investment. And the third piece is all around driving this common language around shopper. So this is really just around getting everybody who is involved in the grocery environment, so be it retailers, be it suppliers, be it external agencies, talking a common language about shopper so that we know that if we're talking about the shopper's needs in this category are X, Y, Z, it's about everybody understanding exactly what that's all about. So it's all, this is a really crucial part of what we do. And because we work with the retailers in the New Zealand grocery environment, it's all about, they, they get it, they understand it, they know it, so you don't have to go and explain what the, this information is when you go in and see them. So it's so all this can be really uh, put down to, to the point of we're trying to put the shoppers at the heart of the decision-making process for planning, for, for brands, for accounts, for retailers, all that. <clears throat> so housekeeping side of things over, what are we actually going to talk about today? Well, there's two things that we're gonna be talking about today. The first one is all about the shopper mindset. So what are they thinking? What are shoppers in New Zealand at the moment actually thinking about their, their grocery shopping experience? What matters to them? And really importantly, how is this actually evolving over time? Because obviously what was important five years ago in the mind of the shopper may not necessarily be as important now as it was back then. So we're gonna have a look at that. We're gonna get into the, into the guts of this and actually understand what do they wanna see and how has that changed over time? That's the first part. The second part that we're gonna talk about is the impact of COVID. So we're all living with COVID at the moment. We all get daily reminders about living with COVID. You know, Auckland still being at level 2.5 and we all had level four lockdown, um, you know, four, four, five, six months ago, however long ago it was now. So we all understand, we all get the fact that COVID is with us for quite some time to come. What we probably don't understand at the moment and what this section is all about is understanding how that has actually changed shopper mindsets about what they expect from grocery shopping and then looking at it through that lens and also understanding what does that mean for the future because certain trends will have been exacerbated certain other trends may have been turned around completely we're all living in a period where things are going to change and evolve quite quickly so let's understand what COVID has done to the shopper mindset and make some crystal ball guesses about what actually we think is going to possibly endure as a result of this so first Let's get into the shopper mindset. So the key message that I would like to just start with here is that 
in, a, in essence, every single person who goes into a grocery store or supermarket in New Zealand is probably going in there for a slightly different reason. There is no one size fits all approach in regards to what shoppers are looking for when they go in, because everybody has their own needs, everyone has their own motivators, everyone has their own occasions and missions that they're going into a grocery store for. So we're well past the time where you're able to say, 98% of my shoppers are coming in to do X, Y, Z. We're not at that point anymore. We're way past that. So the key message here is that every person who is going into a supermarket at the moment, they have different needs and those needs need to be catered for. But before you even get to that, you need to understand what those needs are. And that's where we come in. Generally speaking though, you're probably looking at two things. Well, two distinct buckets when we're talking about shoppers. The first bucket of shoppers is the plan shopper. Now, most of the shoppers who go into a grocery store in New Zealand right now are a plan shopper. It's roughly about 70% or so of all shoppers are planned, give or take. They are going to be planning on different things and for different reasons. So some of the things that may come into, into their, their uh, mindset at the, at the moment are things like, I'm planning to buy on the best price. Now that could very well be, I'm just wanting to buy the cheapest thing or I'm wanting to buy the best value item, but price obviously is a big factor in planning. There's also things on the lines of regular purchase. Now, these are the categories that I actually like to call autopilot categories. So these are the, are the types of categories where a shopper knows what they want. They buy the same thing all the time. If you go in and it's not there, then that's gonna obviously be a bit of a problem potentially because if they're so wedded to a particular item or a particular product that they always get and it's not there, it's not available, then there's a good chance that they're gonna walk somewhere else to go and actually get that product. And we can actually tell you how much of a risk that is to you in your category if that's the case. There's also things like requested. So does the shopper actually buy, are they actually buying for themselves or are they buying for somebody else in the household? Now, this can be strong or weak, depending on the category that we're talking about. But generally speaking, if you are buying on behalf of somebody else, there's a good chance that your knowledge of that category might not necessarily be as good as it would otherwise be if you were buying for yourself and the knowledge was higher. So that's obviously a factor in planning. Mailer is a really important one as well. Mailer is obviously the, the paper mailer that you get and also the digital mailer that comes through an EDM as well. But this is also an interesting area because many of you will know that Coles has stopped doing a paper mailer entirely in, in, over in Australia just last week. So now it's digital from now on. During COVID, obviously both Countdown and New World either cut back or stopped doing the mailer altogether during, during that first lockdown period. So this is to certainly an area which is of interest at the moment. You know, we were looking with great um, interest as to how that decision actually affects Coles and how their planning and uh, usage, usage of the digital mailer actually takes up. But that's an area that's very relevant right now across the Tasman, and it's going to probably be quite relevant here in the, in the near future. And there's also things about planning on preferred brands as well. But you know, that's the planned shopper. On the other side of it, you've also got the impulsive shopper. So this shopper obviously doesn't necessarily know what they were going to do before they came into the store. So lots of things will be uh, coming into their, their consideration set. Promotional price maybe is what they were enticed to buy with. Maybe it was innovation. Maybe they saw something completely new they'd never seen before. So that's that's obviously a, a big factor. Maybe it was the display that enticed them. So the display could have been in the Isle of Value. It could have been at a gondola end. It could have been a wing stack. It could have been a standalone fridge. Something just caught their eye and they bought it as a result of it. It could also be product attributes. So maybe they picked up a product they weren't intending to buy, read the back and found out, actually, this is low GI. I didn't know that. Or it's got low sugar or some other health reason that they, they picked it up for. So product attributes can actually play a very strong role driving impulsive purchasing and visibility as well was a really important factor too. <clears throat> but one thing we can certainly say, and obviously what you see on the screen here is a bit of an extreme example about that because COVID obviously has completely changed the, uh, changed the, the landscape for a number of categories and a number of um, channels. But what we think we can definitely say is, is that needs are evolving and are continuing to evolve. So even before COVID happened, needs were evolving and needs were changing. So the big message here is that the New Zealand grocery landscape is not the same as it was 12 months ago. It's definitely not the same as it was five months ago. And with COVID, it's probably not even the same as it was three or four months ago. So it's really important to understand how these needs are actually evolving over time. 
So one of those things which has evolved over time, and this is actually related to the poll that we uh, just uh, did at the outset of the session, is around the rising trend of shoppers buying for today. So effectively what we have now is about four out of every 10 shoppers who go into a grocery store in New Zealand is buying with the intention of using or eating or drinking that product today. Now that could be straight away. That could be they're gonna go in and buy a cold drink and crack it and walk out and start drinking it as soon as they walk outside of the store. It could be that they're buying for possibly dinner later on in the piece. It could be for possibly they're just simply buying because they've been asked to buy milk on the way home. Whatever the reasoning is, you've got a substantially uh, large portion of the shopping uh, base, which is buying for today, buying to use now. That has increased since 2018 by 3%. This is, and this is a significant increase as well, by the way, given the size of our survey and the number of shoppers that were asking this. So this trend is getting significantly stronger. So it's actually not so much about buying for stocking up any longer. That is still a significant part of what the grocery environment is all about, the, the pantry stock, the main shop. But this particular area is getting far more important now than ever was, and we don't see any reason why this will not continue to get any stronger in, in the uh, years ahead of us. So if you know what sh the shoppers are buying for now, significantly more than they were in the past, then it's also important to understand what's important to these shoppers, because their needs are going to be quite different to the needs of someone who is coming in for, say, uh, maybe a stock up shop or maybe a specific occasion later on the week or maybe a party or something like that. So for those of you who haven't seen our, our system before, the colors here are significant. If you have metrics which are colored green, then that means that those metrics are actually significantly more important for whatever it is that we're talking about than they are just in terms of being compared with, with your average category or the average store. So shoppers who are buying for now, what's really important to them? Offers and fixed low price. So pricing factors are very important to them because those are dark green. But you'll notice as well that there's a lot of other things as well which are important too. So it's important to have a strong layout. It's important to have an authentic range of brands. So not not brands that are Johnny Come Lately's or Me Too's, but brands with, with a story to tell, brands with a history. It's important to them they know exactly in store where these categories sit. Environmental concerns are really important. Staff, which is basically about knowledgeable staff, it's important for shoppers to have access to knowledgeable staff. Innovation, enjoy. So enjoyment is all about enjoying the process of shopping, not enjoying the product itself. But obviously it's very important to enjoy the product as well. And premium. Note at the bottom though, what is something which is not necessarily as important as the others, and that's availability out of stocks. So that's gray. That means it's in line with the average category. So when you're buying for now, availability is actually no more or less important than any other occasion or mission that you're on. But those other things certainly are. Now, contrast that with what you see for shoppers who are buying for later. So these shoppers on the right-hand side are the ones who are buying on a pantry stocking mission or a main shop or, or something like that. So there's exactly the same metrics, but suddenly we've got a completely different mindset at, at play here. Offers and fixed low price, they're still what we call hygiene factors. So they're, they're at a level which is on average you know, compared to everything else, but lots of other factors are actually not important at all. So we've got factors like premium, for example, we have enjoy, we have innovation. It's all these factors, environment, they're not as important, relatively speaking, as it is for a shopper who is buying for now. Those things matter if you're going into buy to, to consume or use now, they don't matter as much to the shoppers if you're buying for later. Note though that there is one thing which is, and that's availability. So shoppers who are buying for later, the ones who are on autopilot, the ones who are buying a regular purchase, what they always buy, what matters most to them is my product there. The other factors are at best hygiene, background noise, some of them actually don't matter too much at all. So that's a really good illustration of just how you cannot have a one size fits all approach. You need to be understanding why shoppers are coming in, into stores. Uh, in your category, are they coming in to buy for now? Are they coming in to buy for later? Are they coming in to buy for some other reason? And have an offer which actually meets those needs. So what's some examples of categories which are bought for now? Well, here's just a few of them. So these are, the top 10 categories which are bought for now. Now there's lots of 
beverages in here. So we've got sports drinks, natural health, drinks like kombucha and so on, soft drinks, energy, water, flavored milk. So those are all categories which are definitely bought for now. There's also chilled beverages, which is uh, a special category that we look at, which is all about understanding if people are gonna buy a chilled beverage versus an ambient beverage. So you would expect those categories to be in the top 10, certainly, because they are categories which are usually bought to be drunk straight away, or consumed straight away. But there's some interesting ones that come in that maybe you possibly wouldn't consider. So hot chicken, yes. Hot chicken very much being bought for now because if you buy a hot chicken now and you don't eat it now, it's kind of defeats the point. But things like vitamins and supplements and even hair color, those categories are actually being overwhelmingly bought to be used straight away. So it's not about buying a, a bottle of vitamins and then putting it in the pantry and then not opening it for, for three weeks or even hair color. It's, it's about buying those with a view to using them straight away. So obviously in those sorts of categories, things matter more than they would if you were buying for later. So here's some examples of categories that you bought for later. So here's the top 10. Now there's quite a few categories in here which make perfect sense. There's a few which are a little bit surprising in terms of being impulsive, like chocolate biscuits and biscuits and even ice cream tubs, which is quite impulsive as well. But there's lots of pantry stocking categories that you can see in here. Things like frozen vegetables, canned fruit, coffee, tea, eggs, categories where shoppers are concerned about running out and don't want to run out. So they're gonna go and make sure they have enough in the pantry to keep them going. But the big difference between these two areas, the first one, categories being bought for now, this is your opportunity to excite, to entertain, and even to educate shoppers who are looking to do that. If they're looking to buy now, to consume now, then you've got that opportunity to talk to them, excite them and interest them. Categories being bought for later, that's all about executing the purchase. It's about having a clear layout. It's about making sure that they can get in, make their purchase and get out quickly and efficiently. And above all, availability matters in those areas. So, Dan, do we have any questions coming through that, that we'd like to answer at this yeah, point? Yeah, actually, a um, couple of really good ones I think are worth discussing. Um, the first one was around, it's more of a statement or a fact, was around the fact that the um, uh, paper mailers will be available for Coles in store. Um, what that really comes, you know, how effective is that going to be? Really, it's about, you know, you've been talking about the categories that are highly planned. Um, and those are categories where we want to invest our marketing, for example, before the shopper gets into store. So how effective that will be? Um, the answer is it'll be, you know, different categories um, will get a better or, or worse ROI on that. Um, but yeah, uh, I think the important thing is, you know, those categories where they are, it is important to, to, uh, to shoppers to pre-plan and, and, you know, have that pre-store comms. Um, is uh, how do we provide a pathway for those people to still access some sort of pre-store marketing, whether that's a, an easy way to convert paper mailer uh, users into digital? Um, you know, is there some other way that other platforms we can use to engage with them? Um, did you have any comment on that, Andrew, Simon? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because in New Zealand, obviously, there is, there is uh, an, an example already where there is no mailer and that's in Pack and Save. So Pack and Save doesn't have really much uh, trouble engaging with shoppers to understand that there are deals on or that there is uh, something of interest going on in the store right now. So I think if you want to understand what that post mailer world is potentially gonna look like, then use Pack and Save as a, as a bit of a test case to understand that. Personally, I do feel that the mailer is on the way out. I don't see any need for it. And you know, maybe not right now, but certainly in a couple of years' time, I don't see it existing in its current form. The mailer for me is also something which should not necessarily just be used to communicate price and promotion. It should be used to communicate occasionality. It should be used to, to communicate things other than price. You want to be inspired and educated and, and entertained to a large degree in the mailer as well, because the mailer does play quite a significant role in where shoppers decide where they're going to go. Hmm. So that would be my take on that. But it's, it's definitely an area which is uh, going to evolve quite a lot over the next uh, few weeks, months and years. Yeah, um, there's also a question from Paul around, um, you know, is 3% over three years actually a significant shift? Um, and, and I would say absolutely. Um, we in New Zealand, we're covering roughly 38,000 shoppers every year. Um, so a 3% shift, you know, on that scale is, is quite significant. 
Um, and how does that compare to other changes? Um, well, the short answer is, yeah, it, it's substantial. Um, yeah, in terms of, the, there's a few other questions on here, which we might push to the question time at the end, because I think that, you know, that we'll be able to come back to those. So um, perhaps we could move on for now. Apologies to okay. the other question uh, makers there. Cool, all right, well, we'll come back to those. So at this point, I think it's time we do another poll. Just to, again, just you know, get some insight into what you guys are thinking. So this next poll is about what is significantly more important to shoppers now versus five years ago. So is it innovation potentially? Is it environment, so environmental concerns? Is it around New Zealand made? So point of origin? Is it about premium? Or is it actually about, is it more important for shoppers to have healthy choices? available to them in the category. So healthy being obviously low GI or low sugar diet options, that, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so we'll just wait until we've got a, a fairly decent quorum and then I'll, uh, I'll close that off. Okay. Just a few more seconds. All right, so we'll close that now. Cool, so, so the results that we see, so quite a few of you are saying healthy choices are more important um, over the last five years, closely followed by environments and New Zealand made with a, a few of you also saying innovation and premiums. That's very interesting. So hopefully this next few slides I'm gonna go through will actually help bring that to life and help you understand exactly if that is the case or not in terms of what shoppers view is more important over the last five years. So without further ado, I'll just jump into that. So what you're seeing now is our importance ratings. So this, in, in this instance, what we're doing with all of our shoppers that we are surveying is we ask them to rate on a scale of one to five, how important is it to you in whatever category that we've spoken to them about, that you have a good price, that you have a range of offers available to you promotionally, that you have strong availability, that you have environmental aspects covered off in your category. How important is it to you? So you can see there from the results, these are the current scores from 2020, that there are certain things that jump out. Firstly, you've got your pricing factors. So those are all relatively important on the scale of one to five. Overall price image being one of those. Fixed slow price, which is what we're talking about EDLP, or if we're talking about everyday price reassurance, offers is all about promotional deals. So high lows, medium lows, et cetera, twofers, and so on. Then you have your executional factors, which are all about the in-store execution side of things. So how important is it you have a strong range, that the layout is, is uh, easily shopped, that it's easy to find the category, availability, the goods range of new, those sorts of things. And finally, it's all about experiential factors. So experiential factors are all about the experience of shopping the category. So how important is it to you that there is a range of high quality products, the environment, healthy choices, premium, and so on. Now, when we compare this with what's happened over the last five years, some pretty clear trends start to come out. Firstly, what we have here is a significant drop in the level of importance that shoppers have given to price in the New Zealand grocery environment. Now, this does not mean that price is not important. Price is still very important, but five years ago, it was even more so. It was significantly higher than it was now in terms of its level of importance. So that's a significant change. We also have seen a significant drop in the level of importance attached to range. Now that can mean a few things, but generally speaking, there is less importance attached by shoppers to having breadth and depth of range across the, the store than there was five years ago. Things that have actually gone on the up though, Things like innovation, significantly more important than it was to have a range of new coming through. Environment is also much stronger. Premium, authenticity, and enjoy. So all these factors have actually significantly increased over the past five years. So basically what this means is that we, we're seeing a very clear mindset shift in shoppers from 2016 to now. Price is less important. Experiential factors are significantly more important than they were five years ago. Because when we start to look at this in a bit more depth, it's very instructive to understand, okay, fine, the shoppers view these things as important, but what actually really matters is how are these things being delivered to shoppers? So it's important to understand if these things are being done better than they were five years ago, 
or in the eyes of the shoppers, they're actually being done worse than they were five years ago. So under experiential, a few things are being done a lot better. So quality messaging is coming through a lot more strongly. Healthy choices is being done a lot better than it was five years ago. And premium is also being done a lot better than it was five years ago. So premium, obviously, is there a range of, of top quality products available in the category? Do I, If I buy premium, do I really notice the difference between buying a premium product and a more value basic level product? There is, however, unfortunately, quite a few things which have not necessarily gotten better over time. And those things are things like New Zealand made, so that the messaging around New Zealand made is worse than it was five years ago. Environment has gotten significantly more important, but shoppers are not seeing an improvement in delivery, unfortunately, in this area. Same with authenticity and same with enjoy. So shoppers have, are viewing it much more important than it ever was to actually enjoy the physical process of shopping the product and to have an authentic experience with the brands that are there, but these are actually are not improving. In fact, they've actually worsened on prior year. So that's a concern. As far as executional factors are concerned, well, like we said at the outset, range has gotten less important and innovation has gotten more so important. So a couple of things have gotten better over time. So shoppers are generally giving a big thumbs up to layouts across the store. They're saying that they have, they're performing better now than they did five years ago. Same with location. So where exactly is the category in the store at the moment? So, so that's good. It means that shoppers are better able to find their categories in store than they were. And when they get to the fixture, the layout is making more sense than it did five, five years ago. Unfortunately though, there are a few things which are not. So range has, has fallen away in terms of its level of performance. Availability, worryingly, has also fallen away too. And innovation. So it's far more important now than it was for shoppers to be able to see new things in, categ in categories across the store, but they're not seeing them. So the headline here is that navigation has certainly improved, but the cut through, unfortunately, on range is, is actually a, a bit of an issue. It's not as good as it needs to be and has actually worsened over the last five years. And when we have a look at pricing, so again, remember these pricing factors that I said a few minutes ago, price is all about the overall price image that the shoppers have of that category. Fixed low price is about your everyday price reassurance. It can also mean EDLP. So if it's if you're part of an EDLP program, this metric does actually refer to that, as well as just the everyday price reassurance, which essentially is the difference that a shopper feels between being on promo and being at shelf. It's just that reassure me that I'm not being ripped off every day that I go in or any particular day that I go into the store. And offers is about your high lows, it's about your multi-buys, two fizz, three fizz and so forth. So these are all still very important factors in the shopping experience. They have decreased in importance significantly since 2016. But unfortunately, I have to report that none of these factors have actually gotten better. So even though shoppers have lessened their expectations in price since 2016, the performance has actually gotten worse since 2016. So unfortunately, what this means is that the pricing hierarchy, the pricing structures in general across all of New Zealand grocery is out of whack with expectation. Shoppers are not necessarily wanting to see everything on promotion. Shoppers are not necessarily wanting to see everything on an EDLP or, or a best value or whatever the the particular label might be. They're not necessarily wanting to see that across everything. And as a result of that, the one size fits all approach, which we've seen quite a bit over the last, uh, you know, last five, 10 years, is actually translating through to shoppers not being happy and performance wise has actually worsened in pricing over the last five years. So the big question about all this is that if you want to move shoppers from being unhappy to actually being a lot more happy than they were, then what do you need to do? Do you need to take an approach across the entire store? Well, the answer is no, you don't. What you actually need to do is you need to focus where it matters. There is no point wasting time or energy and money on a category where price doesn't matter or where layout doesn't matter or where availability doesn't matter. I'll show you an example of what I mean. So at the top here, what we've got is our colour schemes, again, that we've been, uh, I've been showing you a bit so far through this session. If in terms of, and these are all importance ratings that I'm talking about here. So if we have categories which are reds or yellows, 
what it means is that if your category falls under that for whatever metric we're talking about, it's not a differentiator. You don't have to do more than essentially the bare minimum. You just have to tick the box. You can focus on other areas. If it's a gray, it means that this is a hygiene factor. So you must be competitive on that metric, but you don't need to overinvest. You don't necessarily need to win in order to, to make this good. If you're a light green or a dark green, it means you're a differentiator. So that means you have to invest in, in this aspect of the category experience because shoppers do view this as extremely crucial. It's very important to them. So let me just you know, demonstrate this with a couple of examples. Firstly, here's offers. So there's obviously 121 categories that we're covering because if you can add those up, it comes to 121. 32 of those categories fall under being not a differentiator. So and examples of those are toilet cleaner, breakfast cereals, and tea. Shoppers in those categories do not expect there to be offers or good offers in this category. Do the bare minimum. You don't have to overinvest. You don't need to be high low in breakfast cereals. You don't need to be high low in tea necessarily. They're not expecting it, so you don't need to do it. There's 58 categories where you must be competitive, but you don't necessarily need to win. You don't need to overinvest. So pay attention to what's going on in the wider uh, in the wider retailing landscape but you don't necessarily have to go, wow, I've got to be extremely deep on sports drinks or really hot deals on skincare. And there's 58 categories which fall into that area. And then you've got these 31 categories over where in the differentiation area where it does matter. So if you want to move the needle, if you want to move perception on offers, focus on those categories, focus on the 31 where it actually matters. White wines is an example of that. Cheese, coffee, those, all those shoppers in those categories expect offers, they want them, and you, they need to be good to meet those expectations. Change perception by focusing on those 31 categories. You won't change perception by focusing on the 32 uh, over to, to the left or the 58 in the center. Here's another example. Here's New Zealand, oh, went too far there, New Zealand made. So New Zealand made, same sort of scenario. You've got 48 categories, which are not a differentiator. They, shoppers do not necessarily need to know that this is made in New Zealand. They're not, not really caring as much as they would elsewhere. Snacking nuts, dog food, herbs and spices are good examples of that. Then there's the 37 categories in the middle where it's probably advantageous to, to talk about it being made in New Zealand, if it is, but you don't necessarily have to over invest in, in that messaging. But then there's 36 categories over on, on the green, on the side there on the green, like eggs and baby food and yogurt, where it is advantageous to talk about being made in New Zealand. Shoppers expect it. So if they expect it, and you actually have competitive brands that aren't made in New Zealand, then by all means, talk about the fact you're made in New Zealand, because it will move the needle. Shoppers will notice, they will get it, they'll be excited by that. And another example just down here as well is all about innovation, which you just saw briefly come up before I, where I hit the, uh, the button too hard. So innovation, innovation is all about 39 categories, toothpaste, jams and spreads, et cetera, where it doesn't matter, don't focus on that. Hygiene in the middle, the 41 categories, nappies and soft drink. Yeah, focus on those, but don't overinvest. And there's heaps of categories where you don't necessarily need to invest. So I'm now going to throw this over to Simon Ford. Simon, can you give us a bit of an insight as to how this is looking in Australia, what I've just gone through? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So morning, everybody. Uh, so my role in this is to give you a a global lens on this. Obviously, I'll focus on Australia, but we also run these programs in uh, North America and, and Europe as well. Um, here's a summary of the trends that uh, Andrew's just talked us through from a New Zealand point of view. So the question to ask yourself is, do you think these, are, uh, these trends are consistent globally, uh, including Australia, uh, or unique to New Zealand? Um, well, there's a bit of both. So we'll start with similarities. I mean, the big global trend that uh, Andrew's uh, talked to is this idea of people shopping more frequently, shopping smaller baskets, shopping for today rather than tomorrow, shopping for a specific occasion uh, like dinner for tonight or lunch uh, or hair colour we saw from a health and beauty point of view. Now what that means is, uh, as we saw in New Zealand, is that the, the, uh, the time frame between shopping and consuming is, is reduced and what that means is experiential factors like innovation, the enjoyable shopping experience, uh, the authenticity or provenance of brands is really important to people. It's, it's uh, increased. 
So the role of the, the shelf, the role of the store um, is, is heightened in terms of uh, offering those uh, factors at shelf or, or on the packaging and, and bringing that to life. Uh, the flip side of that on a seesaw of importance is the relative importance of price has decreased over time. So we see that globally. This is a global uh, trend. Uh, there was a question before about the 3%. Is it significant? Um, absolutely, it is significant, although I would say that percentage is higher globally. Um, the acceleration of that trend um, is, is higher, particularly in Europe. Um, again, I would suggest, given how we know European and, and uh, other uh, country trends come into this region, that that is very much going to continue. And we're talking long-term trends here, and we'll talk about COVID in a minute, but from the, from the long-term factors, this is very much uh, how shoppers are changing and how grocery as a channel needs to change to keep up with these changing needs. So that's what we see in New Zealand, that's what we see globally. The big difference uh, you can see on the slide is around price, price satisfaction. So we saw it decreasing in New Zealand, uh, becoming uh, or delivered, or shoppers are telling us it's being delivered less effectively in New Zealand. We see the opposite in Australia. So price satisfaction is significantly increased in particularly in the last uh, three or four years from, from the majors here, probably driven a lot by Audi coming in, getting their act together uh, and forcing the majors to become more competitive on price. Um, now, there's lots of reasons for that. But if I had to pick one, I'd say it was this idea of uh, Australian retailers more effectively isolating or, or identifying the categories, the segments, the brands they need to focus on. Uh, to, to um, have greatest impact on price. So just as uh, an example of this, in my previous life, I was um, I headed up the insights team for Tesco uh, supermarkets in the UK. We were really up against it, against Asda, Walmart on price. We knew we were, we knew we needed to get better on price. Uh, the board was focused on this. And I remember in the early days then saying, right, you know, we need to be better on price. Let's be, let's say 5% cheaper um, and every, uh, commercial team, every buyer and ultimately every supplier was told they have to be 5% cheaper. Um, and so very efficient from an operational point of view in terms of getting people to you know, make this happen, clear KPIs, off we went, uh, very inefficient in terms of the impact it had and the, the return on investment of that price investment, because in some categories clearly had massive impacts and shoppers loved it. And they bought more and they came back and, and so on, or they switched. Uh, in other categories, didn't even notice or certainly didn't have as much impact. So, you know, the moral of the story, and we, we figured this out, um, Australian retailers are a lot better at this now, is identifying the categories and the segments and the brands where you go hard on price and those which you don't. And it's not just about looking at past behavior and, and sensitivities. It's about asking the shopper and understanding the mindset of the shopper in terms of you know, where it's going to have greatest impact. Um, so that's something Australia retailers and suppliers, of course, are, are doing well over here. And there's, there's a lesson in there, I think, for the New Zealand market. So back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, so I think that that's a very valid point. It's We've got lessons to learn from how the Australian retailers are doing things. And I think that is the, the key area that we need to take a lot of learnings from because we've got different set of circumstances in terms of satisfaction happening over here than in Australia, but a similar kind of trend term, in terms of importance. We need to learn from Australia and take those learnings on board and apply them over here. So that's enough about shopper mindset. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about COVID. So COVID is obviously very topical and it's going to continue to be topical for quite some time now. Now there's two questions that I really want to answer in this section about COVID. The firstly is what effects did the COVID-19 outbreak actually have on shopper behaviours and motivations? And the secondly is if we look into the crystal ball, well probably a bit more scientific than the crystal ball, but a crystal ball it and understand what are these things are actually going to endure over, over the long term. So before we do that though, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get your guys input as to what you think are actually those most likely things to have had or changed in terms of shopper behaviours and motivations as a result of COVID. So we'll do another poll now, <clears throat> excuse me, and we'll see what you guys are thinking on those lines. Yeah, hi so Andrew. Um, we yeah we we had planned to do another question time right now. I'm it's a, we've got amazing engagement in the question function, 
Um, we will try and get through the session on time. And uh, if, if those of you who can stick around afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to stay longer. Uh, but we will be in contact afterwards if we don't get to your question uh, today in the session. So um, yeah, we'll do our best. Um, let's uh, have a look at that poll. So that poll coming up now is, what effects do you think that COVID has had on shoppers? Has it made price more important to shoppers? Has it made shoppers more open to private label? Is innovation now more important to shoppers? Has there been an increase in stock up shopping? Has the enjoyment of the shop actually decreased as a result of COVID? <clears throat> yeah, just on this one, uh, reminding people that you can choose uh, all that apply in this poll. The previous two were select one. Uh, so feel free to click on as many as you think are applicable. Cool. So we'll keep it going for a couple more seconds. And yeah, we'll see. Give it, give it 10 seconds or so, and we should have yeah. a, a good response rate. All right, closing in five, four, three, two, one. All right, here we go. All right, so the results are that the most popular options are an increase in stock up shopping, more openness to private label than there was in the past, with good support as well for enjoyment of shop decreasing, and price being more important as well, plus innovation being a little few people going for innovation being more important. So I'm actually going to try and answer those questions over the next 15 minutes. Um, on that score. So let's, let's go and have a look at this. So firstly, just want to set the scene here with, with uh, some information from Euromonitor. So they did a study not very long ago around just what actually has COVID done to consumer trends. And, and there's been a, a rise of a lot of things coming out of this. So effectively, we've got the home tainment angle. So shoppers adapting daily routines, staying at home longer, the home tainment cooking angle, socialising, eating at home. And that's all about the new normal as well. So is there actually going to be something which happens in the future? And they're uh, foreshadowed very much so that it will be. Yeah, then you've also got the rise of the online channel and that, that sort of angle. And also the piece around, will consumers necessarily become a bit more risk averse? So what's their attitude necessarily going to be to innovation in the new core? And then you've got some other you know, angles around so that the societal angle, environmental, economic value, sustainability, and a really important piece, I believe, as well, around the mental and emotional wellness. So these are all the sort of things that COVID is expected to have an impact on and to change the way that we shop and the way that we think and the way that we live our daily lives. So it's in that kind of um, headspace that I'm going to go in and jump into and have a look at some of these things which are going on from the grocery perspective in New Zealand. So before I do that, I just want to quickly illustrate um, what we use as a retailer framework to understand the roles that categories play. Now, without getting into too much detail, essentially what this is trying to do is to help you understand what role does your category play in the realm of the, of the entire store. So if it's on the left, it's a much more of an impulsive decision to buy the category. If it's on the right, it's a more planned decision to buy. If it's at the top of the, of the, um, of the chart, it's more about differentiation, so brands matter more. Retail loyalty is stronger. Trap story is really important. Lower down, a little bit more commoditized. Brands matter a little bit less. It's more about executing a basic transaction more than anything else. So the interesting thing here is that COVID has actually come in and has actually changed the way the grocery uh, environment runs. So effectively what COVID has done is it's moved the goalposts. Things have changed in, to the sense that if your role was a, at a certain place before COVID, there's actually a pretty good chance that the role that your category plays in the role of the store as a traffic driver or a driver of spend has actually fundamentally shifted as a result of COVID. Now that's really scary if you don't actually have visibility into what the exact changes are that COVID has done to your shoppers and has done to the, the way that they perceive your, your category and the role that it plays within the realm of the wider store. <clears throat> So here's an example of some things that have, written, have, have changed. So this is just showing you the role of price or the importance of price over time and the importance of a lot of other factors we've spoken about today already. So you can see from 2016 through to 2020, all those experiential factors like environment and premium and innovation and so forth have all steadily increased over the past five years. And price has come down from a, being a lot more important than it was five years ago to being where it is now. But if I introduce the actual, the COVID line here, you can see that COVID has actually not moved the needle on price at all. 
Shoppers do not view price as any more or less important as they did before COVID actually started. But these other experiential factors like environment, like enjoy, like innovation, have all continued to get more important. So actually, COVID has not altered any any uh, mentality around what people are concerned about in terms of price. It's other factors that COVID has actually altered. So let's go and have a look at some of these things now. Firstly, this metric, which is called new and different buy more, this is all about innovation driving incremental spend. So before COVID, it was certainly quite a strong factor and it was quite consistent across all the three retailers. Post COVID, or during COVID, I should say, is that actually spiked quite significantly. It did actually mean that new could drive incremental in the grocery environment if shoppers saw it, if they could find it. If they saw something which was new during COVID, they were more inclined to buy it as well as what they were also going to buy. And that spiked in new world, spiked in pack, but interestingly enough, it didn't actually spike in countdown. So the countdown shopper was a bit more conservative in that sense. Maybe they didn't have as much new things as they would have seen in, in the past happening there, but that is one factor which really did spike during COVID. Another factor which came up was buy because I feel like it, and this is basically pure impulsivity. Quite a strong factor again, consistent across all three banners, but the buy because I feel like it significantly jumped during the period of COVID. And this is really just down to the fact that shoppers just felt, they felt enabled to be able to treat themselves. You couldn't do anything else during COVID. You couldn't go out to the to a, to a cafe or a, you know anything else like that. You pretty much could only go to the grocery store. So the desire to treat yourself was quite substantially stronger than it was uh, pre-COVID. <clears throat> and we start breaking down things about you know, the actual shopper profile. So some different things start happening as well. So stock up shopping did increase. So either a large or a small shop to use later. The pantry stocking aspect significantly increased uh, compared with, with pre-COVID. Planning certainly jumped as well. So uh, I said before at the outset, the 70% of all shoppers plan well, that jumped up by 3% during COVID. So again, that's a significant jump. Interestingly enough, we had people actually uh, starting to shop a bit earlier in the day than they would otherwise have been doing uh, pre-COVID. So get in, do what you've got to do and get out again to reduce your exposure potentially. Ooh. And what you also had as well was you had a, a bit of a difference as well in terms of the actual um, demographic profile of shoppers as well. So a lot more males were shopping during COVID and a lot more younger people were shopping during COVID. Now, certainly from my experience, this makes perfect sense to me. I am the primary household shopper anyway. But what I did as well is I also shopped for my parents who lived in a, in a rest, who live in a rest home. So the experience that I can relate to that is that definitely lots of people who felt a bit more able to cope with the experience of being out and about in COVID were doing the shopping for other people as well. So definitely change in, in this um, shopper profile that we saw. Some other things that were really interesting that happened during COVID, planning to buy on a particular brand. Well, planning went up, but the planning appears to have been at a category level rather than a brand level because the planning on a particular brand actually dropped away. It wasn't as strong as it was during uh, the, the pre-COVID period. So shoppers were more thinking, less thinking I have a particular brand in mind and more thinking I have a particular category in mind. So I want to buy tea rather than the fact that I want to buy bushels or I want to buy PG tips. I just want to buy tea. So that was a significant difference from, from, from the past. And also the willingness to consider private label. Now this one probably doesn't surprise anybody, but this one definitely spiked significantly during the course of COVID. There is absolutely no way, shape or form to sugarcoat this. If you don't have a private label strategy in your categories, you need to have that now because this is going to get more important over time for sure and it got more important in foodstuffs not so much in countdown it was more pams and pams finest where this was was the case so now it's all about crystal ball gazing what do we actually think is likely to endure and what's likely to be COVID 19 specific only well when we look at this we feel that buying for the future and flash stocking up and that increase in planning on categories is probably only going to be a temporary effect and that's really just due to the fact, really, that shoppers are going to return to some kind of normality. Now, we are possibly going to yo-yo between uh, alert levels for some time to come. But as those restrictions ease off, shoppers do start to return to some degree of normality. Yeah. What we feel is probably likely to endure in the future, for sure, is the experiential factors. They were already getting more important. They were always getting more important. And 
All COVID has done is it's turbocharged it. Like I said before, this is the only thing you could do during COVID was go to the grocery stores. And naturally enough, your expectations of the shop went through the roof. You expected way more than, than you did in the past. That to me is just turbocharging the existing trend. The willingness to consider private label. Well, we again, you should be following Australia in that sense. Willingness to, to entertain private label has been increasing in Australia for many years now. And I believe that the COVID is gonna turbocharge that one as well. Things we're not quite sure about yet still to be realized, the role of innovation and this repertoire versus planning a particular brand piece. And that's really just because shoppers were experimenting during COVID quite a bit. I know I certainly was buying things I hadn't bought in a long time. We also don't quite know the full impact of, of the economics scenario. So we know there's a recession. We don't know quite exactly how that's gonna play out in the long run yet. So those two things I don't believe are quite clear yet as to understanding how this is actually gonna pan out in the future. Simon, what's your take on, on what's happened with COVID in Australia? Yeah, so just a, a quick summary of, of how uh, this compares to Australia and, and the rest of the world as well. I mean, unsurprisingly, we're all human beings. So in many ways we've reacted similarly in terms of um, going back to how we used to shop, which is uh, uh, less frequent shops, bigger baskets, highly planned, big impact um, in terms of the role of planning as we see in New Zealand. and big impact in terms of, of the mailer or catalogue here in terms of its role. Um, we have done some recent work around the role of paper versus digital. We know that half the people who shop, who actually choose a category because of uh, the catalogue in Australia, um, read paper only. So that's half of uh, the impact, uh, the other half being either both or, or digitals. And we are now monitoring this in New Zealand to watch this space. Um, as, as trends continue there, but it's, it's big news over here. Um, the, the difference is very quickly in terms of, of COVID impact. So we're not seeing the bounce back on things like innovation um, and shopping experience that you guys are seeing in, in New Zealand. Um, it's still very much price focused. And, and when I say price, very important to say there are two aspects to this. One is the retreat to value. So people either losing income or losing some of their income, getting worried about future income, um, seeking out cheaper, uh, less expensive brands, seeking out private labels, significant increase in the willingness to try private label as we see in New Zealand. Now, this is the big departure from North America and European markets where private label was and still is, or the willingness to try it was and still is very high. Um, what we're doing here in this part of the world is playing catch up and really COVID has accelerated the, the willingness to try private labels. So, you know, walking into your next range review, be ready. Because um, if I was a retailer now, I'd say, right, this is the, the chance to turbocharge my range around private label because there is significant shopper willingness to try or set change in that. However, the second aspect to price is the flight to premium. Lots of people still have just as much income or maybe even more, um, or even if they don't, they're unable to spend it uh, doing normal stuff. Um, but they can treat themselves at the supermarket and buy something nice. So there are certain categories, and this is polarizing, but there are certain categories, and the question is, is yours one of them, um, where uh, shoppers are more willing uh, to trade up, uh, they're more willing to, to pay a bit more, um, and they're looking for it. So uh, blades and razors, facial skincare, chill drinks, multi-pack biscuits, just some examples of that. Um, the, the learning on this is understand your category because at a national level, these things move slowly, but there are certain categories where it's all about value, all about private label. There are certain categories or, or, or segments which are all about premium um, and brands as well. So understanding that um, is absolutely important. Otherwise, you, you, you're risking uh, getting it wrong in terms of how your shop has changed or how the retailer is now thinking. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Simon. So if I was just to summarize all this up, what we've shown you today, there's, there's two key messages that I would um, take out of this. The first one being is that, I've said this quite a bit over the last hour, one size doesn't fit all. So it's really important to understand how the shoppers in your category in particular think and behave differently. Because what was good for one category is not necessarily gonna be good for the other. And we need to make sure that the retail environment reflects this as well. It's no longer good enough to, to just simply have a strict pricing hierarchy across an entire store. It's, no, it's not good enough to simply say, we're gonna be pushing New Zealand made across the entire store. You have to do it where it matters, 
you have to understand where exactly that actually will move the needle. And the second piece is all about COVID. COVID has moved the goalposts. It absolutely has. So it's more important than it ever was to understand how that has changed the environment and to talk to your retailers about how that has actually changed things uh, for you in, in the category. Because the message is COVID is not going away. We all hoped it would quite quickly and experience has shown us that it certainly is not going away quickly at all. It's here for a, a long time and the effects that it's going to have on grocery retailing is going to be quite considerable for, the, for the, the years to come. So those are the two key messages that I would leave you with today and I will pass over to Dan to finish things off. Yeah, hi, well, look, thanks everybody for attending. We've had a, an amazing um, group of people in the chat in the, uh, in the question functions. Um, really appreciate your engagement there. Um, I guess we've just got a, one or two that we can talk to. I know we're uh, at time now. Um, so for those of you that need to uh, move on, thank you again. Um, stay safe and kia kaha. Um, just in terms of, and we will follow up with you post session. So we've got a list of all the questions and the questioners. Um, and uh, look, if we're able to get in touch with you and get some feedback, that would be uh, really helpful for us and much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I think probably the one, let's just do one question for now in terms of it's particularly relevant, I think, to the COVID, um, which is around what do we think the impact of, you know, potential recession would actually have on shopper mindset, um, particularly, you know, their in, um, impacts on price sensitivity, um, importance of price, that sort of thing. So just quickly, um, we don't tend to see much of a shift in the importance of that one price metric, generally speaking, but what we do see is an increase in the sensitivity uh, to pricing. And by that, we're referring to metrics such as price beacon, um, which indicates you know, how likely a shopper is to rate that retailer on the price or the value that they felt that they got uh, in buying that category. Um, and in terms of the influence of um, price in terms of promotions pre-store influencing where they'll actually go to shop um, so yeah I don't know Andrew Simon do you want to add to that yeah I mean it's the one clear thing that we've seen through this information is that shoppers do not place a higher importance on price through COVID than they did pre-COVID but it's, it's a, it, as Dan said it's about that sensitivity angle to price so they're probably planning on what well not probably they are planning on price a little bit more than they were they are a little bit more open to price comparing across retailers but they don't necessarily have this deep-seated need to seek out the best cheapest option across the entire store so the role of price hasn't really changed in terms of COVID it's still there it's still always been what it is it's much more about just being aware of the fact that shoppers are going to be a little bit more sensitive to price in certain categories. But again, it comes down to, is this actually an, an issue for my category or is it not? It's, it all boils down to that and understanding that, it's, you know, again, you can't take the same approach across the entire store to price just because COVID's yeah. rolled through. And even within a category, there's certain segments particularly uh, and brands that um, you, you will see differing levels of change. Correct. Simon? Uh, well, I, th I think you guys have covered it really. I mean, it's it's all about the the, the one thing we saw post GFC as as a benchmark on um, arguably a very different type of global impact, but um, a, a good benchmark nevertheless is is um, is the polarisation point that Andrew's just talked to. Really, um, yes, of course, price becomes more important as people um, economically suffer uh, for whatever reason or, or fear that they might suffer uh, in future. Um, but equally, we saw a big shift towards premium in certain categories and brands. We saw brands take advantage of that. Um, you know, brands like A2 Milk taking advantage of a health proposition uh, in what is a very commodity price-led category. Um, so, you know, there still is a, a strong role for strong brands to premiumize and, and innovate around that. Um, However, there is a big red flag around private label and value as well. And, and what's the role of your brand as a supplier brand playing against um, that value tier? So it all comes back to, you know, you've got to understand your category and, and the uniqueness of how your category and your shopper in that category is changing. Mm. 
Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and thank you, everybody. We've still got 87 people here. So um, just again, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to let us uh, show this uh, to you and take you through it. Um, we will we'll be in touch uh, following the session, but for now, um, good morning, good evening, and good night. Thank you all very much.